Today is the 22nd? Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, in, we're on. Interview of Mr. John F. Uh, McAlevey. McAlevey, correct. McAlevey on uh, 22 May 2001, Lexington Avenue, Warmery, New York City. Interviewer is Lieutenant Colonel Robert Von Hassel, and videographer is Mr. Wayne Clark. Uh, tell me about where you were born and raised. Uh, born in the house my mother was born in, in Brooklyn, New York, uh, January 1923. Okay. What part of Brooklyn? Well, we didn't think we had a name then. It's now called uh, Sunset Park. I was within a block of Sunset Park, and uh, it's at we used to describe ourselves as halfway between South Brooklyn and Bay Ridge, mm -hmm. uh, but overlooking the harbor in uh, what was then largely uh, Scandinavian enclave around Central Park, where they had cooperative apartments. And Swedes and Finns that had moved in and worth their cooperative lifestyle. And Tell us about your family. Uh, well, my father was uh, in World War One. Uh, courtesy of the Kaiser, he met my mother because he was stationed at Fort Hamilton. Uh, he was a Sergeant Farrier because he did blacksmithing and he did all the shoeing for all the horses and mules and all the posts in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, met her at some USO dance or whatever the comparable thing was at the time. And uh, she was the youngest daughter, so he stayed in Brooklyn and uh, lived in that house. And uh, that's where I was born and raised until I post war uh, left and got married. My whole life was in that, uh, in that house until, until I moved to a temporary housing project after the war post Camp Shanks in Rockland County. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time I was in law school. Where, uh, where did you go to school before the war? Uh, I went to Manhattan College, and at that time Manhattan College had a Staten Island division that had been open uh, for the purpose of servicing uh, young men in Bay Ridge and in Staten Island who would find it difficult to get up to the uh, campus in the uh, 242nd Street. Uh, it didn't last and it's not there any longer, but it was an, an experiment because the dean of the clergy on Staten Island is a Manhattan alumnus and on the board or something and he wanted this facility there. Of course, people, he had some Bayonne too, they come over. It was a day house school. It's a poor man's college. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, my father, who only had a sixth grade education, but did very well in his trade, just knew I had to have an education, whatever it was. He didn't know, but an education was a wonderful thing, and I was going to go to college, so I went to college. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and lived at home, and they hopped over seven and a half dollars of credit or something. That was, that was there when the war broke out. You remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I think I was home. I came over the radio. Uh, yeah, it's very, kind of dramatic. You remember what you were thinking at the time? Not really, except that here it is, you know, uh, the young man, we go. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but the brothers at Manhattan pulled us all together, gave us a big lecture. Uh, not to rush off and gave us all these horror stories about the guy who interrupted his education and wound up standing guard at the uh, local reservoir for the war, and what was the point of that, and stay here, get your they, they really had a strategy. They knew that we would be better off the more credits, college credits we had when we were in. So they persuaded us to, you know, stay there and wait. Well, I stayed and waited for a while, but then in uh, uh, August of 42, I went down to uh, Whitehall Street and uh, enlisted. I wanted to be a flyer. I wanted to specifically join the aviation cadets. Mm -hmm. So uh, <clears throat> the, uh, by that time, of course, uh, there were, the pipeline was so full that uh, they took me in and they, I passed all the uh, appropriate physicals and so on and uh, they said, okay, you're in the Army, now go home and we'll tell you when to come. And when was that? Uh, August of uh, 42. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happened in the beginning of World War II, the Army and the Navy both knew they were in for a long haul. They also knew they were very understaffed. They needed an officer corps, they needed people to do technical services. And they went into a recruiting frenzy of competition to sign up the brightest and the best for them before the other side got them. Mm -hmm. The other side being the Navy in the case of the Army or vice versa. And they had all these programs for college people. And uh, 
I wasn't in one of those, although a very good friend of mine, uh, John Larkin, uh, joined the Marines and we kept in touch throughout the war. It's a funny side story, it doesn't have anything to do with this, but anyway, uh, <coughs> I was just, I just enlisted to go right into the, into the Air Force and uh, into pilot training, but I was told to wait. They had signed up so many people they couldn't use me, mm -hmm. but they weren't going to waste me on something else because I was a prime physical specimen in terms of passing every acuity test and uh, manual dexterity test and so on, and uh, so stay, and they'll tell you when to come. So then it wasn't until January of 43 that I was actually told to report to Penn Station and get on a train. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that started my, uh, started the active portion of my military career. But even then, I think they did it, they had a thing called the, the College Training Detachment. Now the College Training Detachment, detachment in all honesty, I think it was a big waste of time, but it was a politically necessary thing to do. The theory was, the rationalization for it was, that they were going to take all these chaps. Before the war, you had to have at least two years of college to become an aviation cadet. This was, of course, dropped. All you needed to be was in top physical condition and so on, um, and be a volunteer. Um, the theory was that they were taking chaps from all different kinds of backgrounds and they were going to equalize the education a little bit by putting them in these college training detachments. The fact of the matter is that it was probably a, a scandal that guys like me was at, still at home when we should have been off doing something. We're walking around, we're still in the school, and everybody says, you know, what's with him? So they put us in these college training detachments, and for two or three or four months, in my case, I think it was like four months after basic training in Atlantic City, that our train was brought up to the University of uh, uh, Vermont in Burlington. And up there we were going to classes and so on, but they were really, it was time fulfilling. And until there was room in the pipeline. Uh, so we, we were at the University of uh, Vermont for three or four months, I don't remember precisely. And uh, time came, okay, on a train, go to Nashville, Tennessee for classification. Mm -hmm. We used to do everything in classification. We got my choice of being assigned for pilot training. Um, and uh, there was no delay after Nashville. Once they brought you to Nashville for classification, they should be off a bomb in your navigator or where you plunked out one the gunnery or whatever. Um, then you were in the cadet program. So from Nashville, Maxwell, Alabama, for pre-flight for two months, and each, each stage of the uh, training program at that point was a, a two-month segment. Mm -hmm. So it was two months of pre-flight, intensive cadet training, and learning everything they wanted you to know scholarly, uh, school-wise, book-wise, uh, Morse code and uh, this and that and the other thing, whatever. Uh, then on to uh, primary flying school for two months. And again, uh, the Army had a system for uh, coping with their lack of skilled people. The, for primary flying, the Army had contract flying schools staffed by a, a cadre of uh, Army officers who supervised one was a commandant, but all the instructors, except for the check riders, were civilian pilots that signed on, uh, contract pilots, signed on for the duration effectively. And uh, they were very good, and they taught us primary flying, civilian instructors working for the Army. I was at Ludwig Military Aviation Academy in Avon Park, Florida. Mm -hmm. Two months there, uh, to basic training at Macon, uh, Georgia. And uh, <coughs> the primary training was in Stearman's, the biplane uh, PT-17s, we call them, the Navy called them the uh, Yellow Perils. Uh, after uh, that, and uh, there were 200 horsepower open cockpit, uh, very narrow landing gear, easy to ground opening, very good trainers. Better, I think, than the Ryans and the uh, Fairchilds or some of the other primary flying schools because they had wide gear, and I don't think you learned as much about planning tail draggers on those, but everybody did sooner or later. Uh, basic training was where you were introduced to uh, rudimentary instrument flying and uh, night flying. And that was a uh, low wing monoplane, the BT-13, uh, and that was a, like a 400 horsepower engine and uh, also two place train. Uh, Two months there, onto it, and at that, that point there were other classifications and cutoffs. Some people from basic were shipped off to multi-engine. Mm -hmm. I was lucky; I kept 
getting my choices and I went on to uh, single engine advanced. I could have been sent to twin engine advanced and then I would be headed to the bombers. Uh, it was my yen all my life to be a fire pilot. So <laughs> and they always ask us at each stage of, of uh, training before you were shipped out or whatever when you came in, what, 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 do you, what would you like to do of these assignments? So I always put down uh, dive bomber first choice. Single engine pilot, second choice. Twin engine pilot, third choice. Uh, and actually, uh, and that's a, a, an ultimate paradox too. I wanted, I really was serious about dive bomber. I was impressed with the work of the Stukas and so on. And uh, uh, I thought ground support was the thing that, that the Army really had to do to uh, capitalize on what the Germans had showed us the mm -hmm. advanced air support could do for the troops. Uh, of course, by the time I got out, we had no dive bomber squadrons. They were experimented with for a little while, but they weren't necessary. When we needed dive bombing, we used our fighters. Mm -hmm. um, but at any rate, those were my choices. I wound up in uh, Dothan, Alabama, at uh, Napier Field for advanced flying training, another two months. Now we're in a 600 horsepower, uh, still uh, twin engine, retractable gear at this point, uh, trainer. And uh, interestingly, <coughs> Well, the old P-40s were all that we had for frontline fighters, even though we were obsolete when World War II began. Uh, the pipeline for our production had moved along so that now they were able to release P-40s because they were being replaced everywhere with either 47s, 38s, or 51s. So P-40s were coming back into the, the training command, and they gave us <coughs> uh, 10 hours of flying a P-40 in uh, advanced flying school before we even got our wings. And that, of course, is an experience because at this point, you've been with an instructor to get checked out in every airplane. But fighters circa World War II did not have, were no such thing as, there was no such thing as a two-place fighter. Mm -hmm. When the Army gave you a 10, uh, 1044, I think it was, military uh, occupational classification, that was, a, you were a single engine pilot. Uh, in 54. Uh, and it was presumed that you can fly any single engine plane the Army has in its inventory. That's it. You're classified. Go do it. All you have to do is know the numbers. And the same thing. Here are the P-40s. Uh, used to be a frontline fighter. And uh, you get in the thing after you've read the book to tell yourself how it flies. And you take a cockpit check. And you study the book and you sit in the cockpit for a few hours or as much time as you felt you needed. And then somebody, uh, this is a routine checkout for any fighter in World War II. Some senior guy who was authorized to go and do so, in this case of uh, an advanced training, one of the instructors. Uh, blindfold, uh, blindfold, you sit in the cockpit, touch this, touch that, where's this, where's that, because you had to know everything without looking for it. Passed the cockpit check and uh, told them what the numbers were, uh, you know, when did it rotate, what speed did it take off, what did they need to collapse down, and so on. Okay, take it up. <laughs> That's that's a thrill. Now you got to like a 1,200 horsepower engine, <laughs> and it's a, it's a real fighter. And that was a ball for 10 hours uh, there. And uh, of course, we were marked people at that point. We we're on our way to fighters. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, after graduation, graduation and commissioning only in one ceremony at uh, uh, Macon, Georgia. Uh, that was the first. Now it's 18 months since I left home. We were given, I think, seven days or ten days to leave and told to report to Tallahassee, Florida, when we came back. Uh, so that was my, my first first visit home from the time I left Penn Station uh, uh, a year and a half earlier. Uh, and, uh, of course, none of us ever wanted to go home. We, we didn't want to break any anything in the cycle of training because we might miss our gang and uh, you don't miss out on the war. <laughs> so, uh, my grandfather died, the family wanted to know if I could come home. I didn't even ask for it. One of my aunts died, I didn't even go home. <laughs> uh, didn't, wouldn't even ask for it. People would get sick, they wouldn't even go on sick call because they were afraid that they'd be put in the hospital for a few days and maybe we'd ship out, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, at least that was up in, uh, that happened to one of my very good buddies up in, uh, in uh, UVM in, in, uh, in Vermont. Uh, got the worst sunburn I've ever seen. And here it is up in the, uh, uh, high latitudes of, uh, of Vermont, laying out on the rocks on, uh, along uh, Lake Champlain, and he went to sleep in the afternoon in a hot blazing afternoon. He was so sunburned, he got poisoned from the sunburn, he was falling over. We propped him up in the, in the, in the uh, 
formation, you wouldn't go to sick call. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, uh, after coming home for about a week, I guess, uh, reported, uh, jumped on a train with my orders, and went to Tallahassee, Florida. Tallahassee was just a classification place. There were P-40s, uh, replacement training, training units, uh, flying P-40s in Tallahassee, but I was sent down to uh, Venice, Florida, uh, south of Sarasota, and there was a replacement training unit down there. And we flew P-40s extensively for several months. Again, now we're qualified combat pilots. I get uh, the 1054 is now a 1055. I'm a single engine fighter pilot. But uh, again, the, the losses weren't that heavy, and we weren't, didn't move as fast as we could to get overseas. Uh, but finally the day came and uh, we were uh, <coughs> shipped up to uh, Port of Embarkation in Boston and back to New York and where I forget where we got on the ship now in mean, two different places because it's usual. The orders get changed and you go here and then you go there. Mm -hmm. But uh, onto a ship in a convoy uh, and uh, like 14 days at sea or something because of the routes they took and the slowness of the convoy. And, uh, we didn't know where we were going. We were all company grade or lesser forward officers or flight officers and second lieutenants. One, a few chaps had gone through pilot training because they were already commissioned. They were maybe first lieutenants and maybe a captain too. Mm -hmm. Nobody of any authority, so we were put into provisional packets. And uh, some retread major, major from the First World War, who wore balloon wings, uh, was. Uh, put in charge of all of us, all we chaps who were on this ship and we were shipped over to be replacements or whatever. And uh, <clears throat> I guess it was the first time he'd been back to Europe since World War I and he wanted to go see Paris. We didn't know where we were supposed to go. So when the uh, ship, one morning we woke up and the fog was so thick we couldn't see the railing, and finally when the railing, uh, the fog lifted, a little Coast Guard daughter came alongside, everybody's kidding around, oh my God, we went in circles, we're back in Boston or something, you know, well, the U.S. Coast Guard came out to check the ships that were in the convoy, and uh, it turned out to be La Havre. And uh, so this colonel says, okay, we're getting off here, and everybody, you know, the cargo slings unloaded all our foot pockers and things, and we get off in La Havre. He takes us to a railroad station, puts us on a train, and we go to Paris. We wind up in Paris at some uh, replacement depot. They didn't know who the hell we were. They had no, no inkling of who we were, where we were, and the colonel disappeared. <laughs> Nobody knew who we were, where we were destined for. Nobody had our papers. Uh, finally, we were there, therefore, sitting in a, in a tent in, a, uh, in the garden of a chalet uh, in some one of the Parisian suburbs. I think it was one of the Rothschild uh, mansions or something. Still had signs in the garden, uh, don't walk on the grass, mines, 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 you know, because the Germans had used the parade quarters. Now this replacement depot was there. And we're there another week, and so finally they figured out we were supposed to be in the 8th Air Force in England. This, the 9th Air Force didn't need us, and we weren't trained for that. Go over there. They took us out to the uh, Orly or someplace and put us on B-17s and flew us over to uh, London. And uh, there they gave us orders to get on a train and the uh, next day, and. Uh, Couple of you know individual here, period papers go report to such and such. We all went off in different directions to the different fields we were assigned to. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wound up going to a uh, fighter station of the uh, Army Eighth Air Force uh, that was at uh, Air Force Station 133, right smack in the middle of East Anglia, uh, in, in a place called Thetford Forest. It probably was part of Sherwood Forest at one time. It was in, Norfolk, uh, Cambridge border. Mm -hmm. uh, nice thing about it was that our field, the whole of East Anglia, which is the area north of the Thames and south of the Wash, is a flat country. Wonderful airfield country. I mean, there were airfields everywhere. The, eighth, the Royal Air Force and the 8th Air Force. Anytime you took off, you could see three airfields. Uh, but ours was in Bedford Forest, which is but the only forest left in England, is a cultivated forest. And uh, the curvature of the uh, East Anglian coast is such that if we came in in really bad weather and didn't have radio contact or something, if we lined our wings up with the coast and flew a 
over 10 or 15 minutes and come over to the forest and we could put the field then. But at any, at any rate, uh, I had arrived in Europe in December of uh, 44. That's when the convoy arrived. Could have gotten into the outfit a few weeks earlier had we not been dumped in the wrong place. We were supposed to have stayed on the ship until Southampton, we found out later. <laughs> Nobody argued with the colonel, he disappeared. Um, <clears throat> so, at any rate, I, uh, that's, so my first battle style was for the, for the Battle of the Bulge, but I, in all honesty, the outfit was there and I was there, but I wasn't yet on ops, so I didn't, I didn't really do anything for that one, but, but be awarded it because I was in the unit. Uh, the, um, and the usual thing, you're in a, a fighter outfit and they hand you the book and uh, within about a, a few days you feel comfortable of sitting in the cockpit, familiarizing yourself with it, reading the book, reading the numbers, reading what it's supposed to do. And when you're ready, some chaps gives you a blindfold check and say, okay, well, try it out. Which was an interesting thing. Uh, we were talking uh, with Mr. Clark just a little bit before the interview about the different fighters that could be boys in uh, Florida, uh, 51s in, uh, in the uh, combat unit, and later on I was in the uh, occupation and I did a lot of flying with P 47s. Mm -hmm. But uh, the P 51, the business of reading about something in a book and how it performs is interesting because <clears throat> I took off a beautiful airplane. Oh my gosh, it's just it was the greatest thing with propellers. After that came the jets, you know. I mean, it could do everything and uh, nothing outperformed it. Some things matched it. The Tempest may have been just as good, but who needed to produce it? We had the 51. Uh, on paper, I understand that when you read the, the uh, performance characteristics, except maybe for range, uh, the Navy's Corsair seemed to be in the same category, but uh, couldn't have been long range escort. I mean, the 51 could do everything with the drop, additional drop tanks. Uh, but I took the thing up and I'm flying around and oh, it's, it's, it's what a wonderful airplane. And all of a sudden I get to about 17,000 feet. I got a kick in the ass. I thought I was, I thought somebody bounced me and I didn't see him. I didn't, I thought I was hit by something. I didn't know what happened. Shit went like that. And, uh, and all of a sudden I looked around, nobody's there. And I realized what happened. The uh, turbo supercharger kicks in automatically at 17,000 feet. And you, lose, you, you don't realize you're losing engine power as you climb into the thinner air. When a supercharger kicks in and gives you more compression again, you jump forward again. Hmm. Once it happens, it's done. You know it. Thereafter, you know it. You, know, you, you expect it, but the first time, and you've never been in the airplane before, you get these interesting experiences. Uh, so then I wound up uh, going on ops, and uh, then that came to be the other paradox. Uh, I sent uh, Mr. Clark some of my material. Uh, and uh, one of which was a piece I wrote uh, about uh, an incident over the Ramagan Bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, and <clears throat> that, that, the framework for that is the paradox I wanted to talk about. I wanted to be in ground support. I really wanted to be in P-47s on the continent, in the Ninth Air Force. So every time I took off, I'd see some action and I could do some, some, something that I thought would be physically, visibly useful, like supporting the troops. Uh, now, not that, not that supporting the bombers isn't a wonderful thing, they need it terribly, but by the time I was there, they didn't need us that much. The Luftwaffe had pretty much been wiped out. Uh, so, all we had to contend with were the Messerschmitt 262s and the Messerschmitt 163s, which are very infrequent, they had very few of those, but those are the rocket ships. Mm -hmm. The 262s were the twin jets. Um, and we could see them, but we couldn't do anything about them except the, the manner of protection that we gave to the bombers. You, it's the most incredible thing, and it's wonderful to have lived through something that never before could happen in history, never again will happen. Armadas of aircraft. I mean, no country can afford them today. Uh, aircraft cost millions of dollars apiece. In those days, I don't know what they cost, but I think our 51 was only like $50,000. Correct one, we, we had a joke, you know, I'll call up the taxpayers, get another one. Uh, but <clears throat> the 8th Air Force had 3,000, I think, heavy bombers divided into three bomb wings. 
The first bomb wing was all 17s, the third bomb wing was all 17s, and the second bomb wing was all 24s. And uh, I believe our wing was assigned to the first division, which was all 17s. So usually we escorted B-17s. But there was nothing ironclad about that. Once we took out a bunch of uh, Lancasters for a daylight raid, at the time we were sent over to pick up some uh, uh, twin engines for the night Air Force and give them air cover. Because mm -hmm. the 47s didn't usually do that. Uh, but mostly we were doing uh, high altitude bomber escort and uh, keep the Luftwaffe fighters from attacking the bombers. It was bad enough the way they get chopped up every day with a, by the flak. I mean, the fellas took a, a terrible beating every day. I mean, it's just us. Uh, at any rate, <coughs> but the, but when the 262s and the 163s appeared, principally the 262s, um, the only tactic we could do to help to make sure our bombers protected, uh, each group would be assigned a segment of the bomber stream. So you have a stream of like 517 going one after the other, making condensation trails, and by the time they get to the end of it, they're flying in clouds of their own making. Mm. Uh, but at any rate, we'd slide down sideways. You never pointed your nose at, a, at another ship because those were six machine guns and they'd shoot back. They didn't give a damn who you were. You slid down sideways, check the markings, identify the group you're supposed to be in. If it wasn't the right one, go until you found it. And then that's the segment of the bomber stream that your outfit was assigned to protect. And each fighter group had a segment that it was supposed to protect. And our technique was to was to essentially not not fan out, but sit. Uh, at least uh, several of us would sit right over the 17s at a couple of thousand feet above them and keep an eye out. And then if the 262s would come up, of course their orders they were not to engage us. They were up there to get the bombers. They had no tactical advantage with their speed or anything else if we met them head on. So by sitting on top of the bombers that we were assigned to protect, we forced the 262s to go look for boxes that didn't have the fighters in place. And, uh, it's interesting. One, one time, the only time I really got a good look at a 262, we were actually alongside the tail end uh, segment of the bomber stream, and uh, I saw a 262 come up through this cloud of condensation that stretched for miles, undetected, he got into the condensation trail of the stream, came up and hit the last box of bombers before he broke away and disappeared. <laughs> but anyway, the paradox of what I was going to say was I wanted to do ground support and I wound up being in uh, <coughs> high altitude uh, bomber escort. But had I gotten my choice at the stage at which I went through training, I probably not, would not have seen very much combat at all because the Ninth Air Force fighters, well, the ships could take a beating, they always brought their pilots back. The P-47 was a tremendous airplane for, for taking punishment. I mean, someone does not get blown off and he would still be running. I mean, the guy would get home. Uh, and uh, if it was shot up, they had a, you know, the, the 47 had a, like an I-beam along, along the bottom. It's almost a landing skid if you had no gear, you just slid in, nothing happened. Uh, so I probably wouldn't have gotten uh, very many missions in that I had gotten my choice, given how late I was getting it through the cadets. Uh, but by being posted to uh, the 8th Air Force, I did get 29 missions in. And, but there again, I had what I thought was the honor of being uh, regularly assigned to be the wingman for, for chaplain number of Raymond Wetmore, then a captain later. <coughs> uh, died shortly after the war in an air crash. But uh, at any rate, Ray Wetmore was the top ranking Yank fighter ace in the ETO at the end of the war. The other chaps, Freddy and Dobreski and so on, either were shut down or rotated or whatever. And uh, <coughs> so I usually flew on his wing. And the Army had decided that uh, they didn't like the idea that all the aces got killed sooner or later. So they put out special orders, which applied to Wetmore and a couple of others, I think. And he was not allowed to go down and do any ground support. So he wasn't supposed to go below 10,000 feet. They wanted to keep him alive. <laughs> and uh, so I was his wingman. And when the other guys, we broke off escort. The routine was, if there was no engagement, you had fuel and so on, when you're 
your assigned position on the bomber stream and your assigned time to be there if it was up and you were relieved by another group, uh, then you were free to break up, scatter around, look for targets of opportunity, shoot up German airfields, shoot up transport, especially transport. Any trains you could find with fair target, any trucks, you know, just wave anything out that moved. Uh, and uh, so there was a lot of ground uh, attacking going, being done by guys uh, standing out in fours and twos and coming home that way. And I had to, what more, and I had to stay at high altitude, so I, <laughs> I never got to do much grazing. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so anyway, thus was my career. The war folded up after, uh, in, in Europe. <coughs> at that point, of course, we didn't know anything about the atom bomb. Nobody did. The out in the Pacific getting ready to invade Japan and uh, the whole thing, and everybody expecting a long war out there that they were going to, you know, obviously we were going to fight to the last man. I mean, we, we saw how they did it in the Lowly Islands. And uh, so a bunch of us tried to figure out what, what fighter groups from the 8th were going to be going to the Pacific and get transferred, and it was, the traffic jam was terrible flying into those fields trying to <laughs> go <laughs> see if they would take you. Well, it was all a useless endeavor. Uh, we waited for orders. <clears throat> Excuse me. But while we were, and then of course, then we found out the war <coughs> ended in, uh, uh, it ended in Europe in May, and what was it, July or August, and it was over and totally in the Pacific. Um, so then the outfit was sitting around occupying East Anglia, waiting for to be rotated home. There were some groups that were assigned to go to the occupation in Germany. I had some good friends in the 355th group I knew, and uh, they were going to Augsburg to be in part of the occupation army. I wanted to trans when, when the war ended, I figured I wanted to go to Europe. I haven't seen the place. I had no reason to come rushing home. Uh, <coughs> so I volunteered for the occupation, but I was told there was no mechanism for transferring anybody from the 8th Air Force, 8th Air Force to the 9th Air Force. <laughs> so, <laughs> again, but because I had volunteered to stay home, even though I had points, enough points to come home, Ultimately, they did come through because the 9th Air Force needed officers badly. The 9th Air Force Service Command, the ground support units, uh, the, the, the officers and, and enlisted men in those units had been there from the time the war started or the unit was organized until the time the war ended. They weren't like flyers who came in and had a tour of duty and either got killed or captured or rotated and went home or whatever. Uh, those guys had points up the kazoo, and they were all entitled into this ridiculous system that the Army had of demobilizing and ruining the units at the time. They were all entitled to come home, so most of them opted to come home, very few wanted to stay. So the 9th Air Force Service Command was just stripped of its officer corps and most of its uh, experienced uh, enlisted personnel as well. The guys all just left and home, leaving empty units behind. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's where I was sent for the occupation. I didn't go to one of the uh, fighter units to be a fighter pilot. I went over to uh, the 10th Air Depot group, which was in uh, Kassel, Germany. It was a big air depot, uh, part of the 9th Air Force Service Command, and it had <coughs> a half a dozen satellite fields that it serviced and so on. And uh, I happened to run into the outgoing transportation officer in the officers club. Uh, the night I got there, or the second night, before we were given any assignments, and uh, he took a shine to me and uh, he said, look, uh, why don't you ask when they ask you if you have any interest in what you want to do? He says, ask the transportation officers, come to my office, I'll, I'll show you the ropes, I'm going home. He says, and uh, it's a good job because you always have, always have something to drive. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, I, I didn't know anything better, <laughs> so I said, okay. When I was, we were asked if we had any interest in uh, doing this or that, I said I'd like to be in transportation. So I was made the group transportation officer for the 10th Air Depot group. The table of organization called for a major. The previous occupant had been a lieutenant colonel, a self-promoting guy who was looking for a permanent commission. And I was the first lieutenant. I took over the office and I had one white officer who had no combat experience or anything, he was over there because he was sent there, not ready to go home, by the name of Worth Crouch as my assistant. And the two of us were now running the whole transportation office with a couple of, with a German secretary and a couple of German uh, office cleaners or whatever. And 
it was incredible. That's when I learned I had a flair for administration. <laughs> I solved all kinds of problems. Uh, <clears throat> I learned I had a flair for administration. Uh, I learned uh, the ropes. And the Army is a wonderful place to learn anything because you can make expensive mistakes and nobody notices. <laughs> Except I didn't make too many expensive mistakes. Uh, but I didn't know what the routine was with all these people in the service command, the quartermaster the people, and so on. But they always ordered 10 times more than whatever they needed in their requisitions, expecting it, and half of it to be way ahead. Uh, the depot and uh, the depot itself and the satellite fields needed uh, coal for the winter. Uh, this is now we're coming into the winter of uh, 45. Uh, <clears throat> and they had a coal allotment that was supposed to come from uh, Cologne. And the previous occupants of the office had all made trips over there, all these uh, uh, self-important guys who wanted to go over there and make a career for themselves, and they came back empty-handed. Uh, they, they didn't have trucks to send over there to get the coal because they didn't have drivers for the trucks, and the trucks weren't being maintained properly. I did have a, I had a quartermaster truck company under my command. Uh, the commander, the, the CEO of the quartermaster truck company, and I became very good friends and hung out together quite a bit. But, but he was using German drivers, largely, uh, with a cadre of, uh, of his own uh, people who still with, who were still with his outfit. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we just didn't have the, the uh, transport to bring the coal, which we were supposed to go pick up. So I was told that, uh, don't waste your time. Uh, we've been Colonel so-and-so and over there, and he came back empty-handed and so on. Said, they can't say do more than say no to me, too. So I took a truck and a driver, I went to Cologne, and I started looking around, <clears throat> and uh, I went to the appropriate office, the United States Army office that was supposed to be in charge of this thing. As luck would have it, I got there at lunchtime, and the officers were gone. There was a wise old sergeant there who looked at me, and I guess took pity on me, as First Lieutenant Flyboy's in here trying to do something. <laughs> He said, look, Lieutenant, let me tell you something. Get out of here before the officers come back. <laughs> he says, the guy who has the, the say-so here is a British civilian. My name is Stavitz. He's over in an office called North German Coal Control. Go over there, see Stavitz. If he says you can get it by rail, you'll get it by rail. He says, these guys won't do anything for you here. They'll just tell you, you're not authorized to get it by rail. So I said, thank you, Sergeant. <laughs> when I jumped in, my, in the Jeep or 6 by whatever it was, I was I'd take it over there. And... Uh, found Mr. Stavitz in North German Coal Control, told them my sad story, I have no transport, I have no trucks that'll run, they can't go over the mountains, they're burning out their clutches, all the stuff I was told to say, you know, or by the guys in the quartermaster company. Stavitz took pity on me, he says, okay, Lieutenant, and uh, you're allowed to become that, be in there and by rail in about 10 to 12 days. And he sent everything that had been requisitioned. The 10th Air Depot, in Kassel, Germany, when it was closed up, had mountains of coal that nobody had burned because of the way these guys were requisitioned, and I got everything that they had requisitioned. <laughs> Train loads came in, and we had to go out and commandeer <laughs> prisoners from the, all of the outfits around Kassel, hundreds of prisoners, because you can't shovel briquettes. This German coal is soft, and the way they burn it is they compress it into briquettes about so long, and you can't shovel the briquette, you have to practically throw it. If you can't dump them, it's not in a dump truck or in rolling stock on the European railroads, it's terrible. Uh, they don't have dump cars, they don't have any of that kind of stuff. These things are open gondola cars. Practically, you had to pick every brick out by, by hand and throw it into a truck and move it somewhere. <laughs> hundreds of, hundreds of uh, prisoners, and uh, I was almost embarrassed because I thought I wasn't turning the trains around fast enough. This rolling stock was at a premium because the 9th Air Force and the 8th Air Force had wiped out most of the rolling stock. <laughs> so, you had to keep move the freight cars going, and ultimately came home. Now, I've, I've exhausted my monologue. Well, let's, let's hold <laughs> there. We have to change tapes. Oh. Hold on. Roll it. Okay. Tape two, interview of Mr. John F. Uh, McAlevey. McAlevey. On 22 May 2001. So, what happened after the war? Uh... Well, I, I was in a fortunate position. I was able to time when I came home. I knew I would go back to college, and uh, I had two years' worth of credits in as a result of the way the brothers had, 
accelerated programs and encouraged us to take all the courses we could. And uh, so I planned my departure. Uh, interestingly, when I was at Castle, I was also as a chief transportation officer, putting together uh, the uh, packets of troops would come through the depot to be put on the trains to be sent to the cigarette ports. Um, we had a series of ports of uh, debarkation, I guess you would call them, from Europe to take the troops home. And uh, they were given names, Lucky Strike and Chesterfield and so on. And uh, I would ship trainloads of uh, uh, GIs in the 40 and 8s to the uh, whatever cigarette port they were destined for, but they loaded in our, in Castle. And I worked closely with, I guess it was 7th Army uh, transportation people in Castle. Castle, Germany, by the way, uh, was a rail hub like the Chicago of Germany. I mean, everything went in and out of there. Uh, when I was on ops, I remember being over Castle several times. I mean, it was, a, it was one of the worst bombed cities in Germany. Mm -hmm. Bob Hope was there once on a USO tour, and he said, incredible. He said, you could stand on a chair in the middle of the city and see the whole place. I mean, there was nothing standing except uh, uh, stairwells and, and chimneys here and there uh, in the center of the city. Uh, because it had a Henschel locomotive works, it had big marshalling yards, uh, it had Tiger tank factory. It was a critical place to bomb, and it was like even a target of opportunity if you couldn't go anywhere else, bump it on castle. Uh, and at any rate, um, that there was a cute story while I was there, if I can throw it in. Mm -hmm. I was a fly boy, and all I wanted to do was fly and, and fight. I'm going through the cats. Oh, they gave us all this stuff about paperwork and so on. We were in, especially in the free flight at Maxwell, you know, how to become an officer and a gentleman, and this is what you do, and everything has to go through channels, and you know, the first endorsement, second endorsement, all that stuff. Give me one ear out the other. Uh, give me my machine guns and my airplane, and I want to go. So, but the war's over, and I'm flying a desk. Um, and I ordered a train in for shipment out of. Um, how many thousand guys or hundreds of guys? I don't remember. For one of my one of my first orders for a red set, the the army had put together trains that they called red sets. They were a string of 40 and 8 box cars that had been cleaned out supposedly and fitted up to carry troops instead of just putting them in any cattle car that they could find. Mm -hmm. So I ordered a red set, and the first time I ordered one, it came into our our yards, and I went down to uh, and look at it. And I thought it was in atrocious condition. It wasn't cleaned out. And they want me to put troops in here, and I'm supposed to ship it to the port. And I got really ticked off, because if they send me a train that's supposed to take troops, I want the train to be fit to take troops. So <clears throat> I went back to my office, and I dictated a letter complaining to some general in the 7th Army Transportation Corps. It didn't go through channels. I just put it in a mail. <laughs> So a couple of days later, I got called into the colonel's office and sent their depot group, a chap we never saw very much because that colonel, I forget his name, poor chap, should have been a general, but he had an alcohol problem, and we very, very rarely saw him. We saw him when he greeted us the day we were there, and uh, that was about it. But I saw him this day. <laughs> the colonel called his Lieutenant McAlevey in. <laughs> Lieutenant, <laughs> you know anything about procedure to your army? And anyway, I got a, a proper chewing out, and then... After a fashion, I got patted on the back for doing a good job. He knew I was trying to do the right thing, and he was very proud of me, but for Christ's sake, it goes through channels from now on. <laughs> so, anyhow, so then we got out of uh, uh, the war's over, and I timed my, my coming back so that I would arrive back in, uh, in New York and go home and be demobbed uh, in August of uh, 1946, planning to go back to school in September. I wasn't going to lose any time. I couldn't turn down uh, a few extra weeks of uh, getting a first lieutenant's uh, base pay, 50% for flying, 10% for overseas, and uh, what do you get, 3 or 5% for a fogey at that point. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I, was, I was making good money, had no responsibilities, and sending 100% of what I made home because we were living high on selling the cigarettes in the white market. And so I didn't do that directly, though. Uh, cigarettes, I didn't smoke. And cigarettes, we had a, a carton of cigarettes in our weekly uh, uh, ration. We had a wicker ration, we had a cigarette ration, whatever we, you know. And uh, cigarettes were the currency in uh, occupied Germany post-war, all over Europe. And uh, 
the carton of cigarettes cost 50 cents in the VX, no tax. And uh, anybody in, your, in the, any other guy on the post would buy that carton of cigarettes for $25. And uh, if you didn't want to do anything with it yourself, like, and I, I wouldn't go near the black market, but I sold it to another GI. You know, whether he smoked it or what he did with it, I didn't care, but he gave me 25 bucks for my carton of cigarettes. But the guys who solicited the cartons of cigarettes and actually didn't, uh, weren't interested in smoking them, took them downtown Castle, where they turned them over for $50 a carton to the next guy in the chain. And Castle was the last place where our troop trains and supply trains left to go closed door into Berlin. Mm -hmm. uh, so the chaps who sold them to somebody in the uh, 7th Army Transportation Corps for $50 had made 100% profit on their $25 investment. <clears throat> Those guys loaded them on the trains and brought them into Berlin, where they went for $70 or $100 a carton or more. And uh, so that's where the money came from. People were not selling army supplies or things uh, to live high in the occupation. They were just selling cigarettes. You know, there's a bad, there were some people who were, you know, uh, maybe doing other stuff with equipment, but you could, you could, have all the money you could spend if you didn't smoke just by disposing of your cigarettes or getting into the business of being a transfer agent for them. Mm -hmm. And it got so bad that the Army had to put out orders. Uh, they issued currency control books because it was scandalous that guys, guys were sending home multiples of their monthly salary back home. And uh, so they had currency control books, and you couldn't send home more than 100% of your pay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I sent home 100% of my pay and uh, still had a good time. Uh, just on my $25 a week from the cigarettes. Um, at any rate, I came home in August of uh, 1946 and went back to school and uh, back to Manhattan College and uh, did a year there and hadn't known quite what I wanted to do. All I wanted to do was go back and try and figure things out. Decided I wanted to go to uh, law school and uh, applied to both. Uh, I was now back home in the house I was born in. <clears throat> bought myself a, 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 a big uh, 74 or 78 cubic inch Indian motorcycle, same model that New York City police use. That was my transportation. My father had a 36 Buick or something, and uh, so I had a car when I wanted to go on a date or something. Uh, so I used the motorcycle to uh, run from my house in Brooklyn up to um, Manhattan College, and then I walked my papers through uh, 90 Church Street, I guess it is, and. Uh, <clears throat> Got myself active in the reserves for a while, going out at Mitchell, out at Mitchell Field to fly, go out there once or twice, <coughs> once a week anyway, maybe uh, with doing this triangular run on my motorcycle to school and out there back home. Um, so I got uh, most interested in that and went through a few other phases in life. But at any rate, I uh, didn't finish Manhattan College because I, I didn't need to. I was accepted at both Columbia and NYU law schools. and at the, it would have taken me a, another year at Manhattan to get a, a, couple of, uh, a couple of points that I missed. It wasn't worth it. So since they took me without my undergraduate degree, I think it was only only two other people in my class at Columbia that were there without an undergraduate degree. But you know, when I sent my application and I put in a picture of me, captain's uniform and all that sort of nonsense, you know, sure made it made a difference. <laughs> anyway, I got in uh, and uh, went through law school and. Uh, Met a gal who had been in the, in the waves, uh, had been in my class in high school, married her, and uh, moved to Rock, to a temporary housing project in Rockland County called Shanks Village. It was converted from a portion of the old Camp Shanks, a headquarter of embarkation, and uh, started on my civilian career. Mm -hmm. Where was as a lawyer? Well, yes. Uh, I already had a, my first son was born uh, while I was taking my bar exams and I uh, had used up my savings while I was married for a year before I finished law school and we would set up housekeeping and so on. So I needed to work and uh, timing was, was not good. Uh, a little flap was going on over in a place called Korea at the time, June 1950. I got out of law school. I have a commission as a captain in the, uh, in the reserves. I could not get a job. I could not get a job anywhere. Uh, the first thing they wanted to know was, what's your status? Mm -hmm. I said, well, I have, a, I, I have a commission in the reserves. I said, but there's no danger of me being pulled up. I was a fighter pilot. They don't need fighter pilots. And those of us who weren't married are probably all volunteering, you know? So 
They really didn't. I mean, nobody, they didn't call up fighter pilots involuntarily, as far as I know. Um, but that didn't matter. Um, and I wasn't going to volunteer now. I had a wife and a child, and they needed a job. And so, on. so I could not get any work anywhere. I got down to where I was looking at the newspapers and reading the obituaries of lawyers and going to the building where the lawyer had died. And while I was in the building, I would go to the top floor and walk all the way down and stop in and leave my resume in every office that I, I met. I couldn't get a job. Um, so my first job out of law school as a result of uh, uh, that uh, problem of having a reserve commission was as Frosty the Snowman in Macy's Toy Department. <laughs> I never want to hear from Rusty the Snowman again. <laughs> then in January, a friend of mine who had uh, heard about a job that I, I took, I went and interviewed for, was hired right away. He gained house counsel to a National Trade Association. Again, all my life I've been in very fortunate circumstances. I've always been in places where I have initiative or, or command or whatever. And uh, they, were hired, they hired me to be the first attorney for this outfit to build a law department. Mm -hmm. Great. What a faith for putting a guy just out of school. But I, that was my job, and I was there for several years. And uh, <clears throat> there was a merger of that outfit and another one later on, and uh, I lost interest in the job because now I was only in charge of the East Coast uh, instead of the whole country. And coincidentally, uh, things were going on where I lived in a village called Slotesburg in Rockland County. Uh, <clears throat> There were some young Turks that had taken over Slotesburg and were trying to do the right thing by bringing the village into the, the 20th century, and it was resented by the uh, people who didn't want to be in the 20th century. <laughs> they didn't want zoning, they didn't want this, they didn't want that. And those fellows were all going to lose, and I was asked uh, to run for office, and I ran, and I became mayor of the village. I was still working for the Trade Association, but at this point, I did this because it, it consumed my energies. And I really was running the village on a, a telephone credit card from my office in the city. I mean, I was really on top of everything. Because I didn't have as much to do as I had previously before the merger of the uh, two uh, trade associations. And uh, I made quite a splash as uh, the, the mayor of the village of Slotesburg and uh, did an awful lot of things that got a lot of recognition. I also rubbed a lot of people the wrong way because I didn't know how to play politics the right way. I was really the one. And, uh, then I was out of office for a couple of years, and I thought I was in the doghouse forever. And <clears throat> the Democratic leadership in Rockland County recruited me to run for supervisor of the town of Ramapo, which is the largest town in the county. Mm -hmm. And uh, just as with Slotesburg, when I ran for mayor, my running mates and I came in, so we took control of the village board. That was what made it fun. I could do what I needed to do because I had the votes to do it. And the same thing happened when I became supervisor of the town of Ramapo. They, they didn't expect, this was a 100% Republican town. Uh, they didn't expect uh, the Democrats or our slate to win and take control. They just expected me because I had, because of my high personality, my high profile in the town, from having been mayor of Slotesburg and all the publicity I had, all the things I did, I figured I would get in as a minority supervisor, but that didn't matter because under the structure of government in New York State at that time, uh, which we one of a better term for the Commonwealth counties versus the charter counties. Uh, the county is run ex officio by the supervisors of the towns that can comprise the county. And Rockland County only has five towns. It's the smallest county geographically in the state. Ramapo is the largest of its towns. But <clears throat> they, they wanted me to win as an individual, so I went over there. It would be irrelevant if my town was Republican. If I was a Democrat, the Democrats wanted to control the county board of supervisors. They banked on me to do it. What they didn't expect was, and I wasn't sure either, but I won with my whole slate and I took control of the town board in Ramapo. So we had eight wonderful years of turning everything on its head and making all kinds of headlines again, and it was, it was a grand experience. <laughs> and after that? What did I do after that? Oh, then I, I, I hung out a shingle. I didn't go back to the city. I uh, went into the practice of law in Rockland County. Uh, and uh, I had another interesting exposure uh, where I feel I made a contribution again to the, to the public welfare. Uh, the, uh, it's a long story how it happened, but the, the, the cut to the quick. Uh, I was appointed by Governor Carey to the board of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. And uh, I, re 
represented four counties, Orange, Rockland, Duchess, and Putnam counties. And had a full vote, it was a nine person board at the time, I think. And uh, I was there for just short of 10 years on the board and it was very time consuming and it cost me a lot of money, but we could, I could afford it. And my partner, I was in partnership with uh, a gal by the name of Ann Wickman. She was some years younger than me, my wife's age really. Um, my first wife had died, I was a little upset. Subsequent marriage, uh, my wife's age actually. Um, and, uh, but anyway, she tolerated my being absent a couple of days a week in the city doing this stuff instead of making money for the law office. That's we were getting along. She wasn't avaricious and I wasn't avaricious and uh, my wife put up with it and she put up with it. And we, <laughs> so I did it. <laughs> and uh, I was in, uh, this was the time when the city transportation system was a mess. I mean, it was practically on the verge of collapse, circa early 1979. The trains this, were a mess. You remember the graffiti and the filthy stations, mm -hmm. and the maintenance was no better. The whole thing, the buses were falling apart. Uh, <clears throat> the railroad they came in was, was uh, the meter railroad was the Metropolitan Division of Conrail, which never put a nickel into it. Those trains were falling apart. The whole transportation system in the metropolitan near area was a disgrace. And Dick Ravitch came in, replaced the chap by the name of Fisher, who was, we won't say much more about Carol, nice guy, but <laughs> Dick Ravitch was brought in to become chairman of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. He is a tremendously effective executive. He comes from a family of builders. He's a builder himself. He knew how to get things done. He got the money we needed. He hired the right people for to to turn around this, the system. He went to Albany and got, got, got the money for the capital structure. And we rebuilt the New York City subway system and the bus system, and we're proud of it today. And then at that point also, <clears throat> the Congress was unhappy with Conrail, and Conrail was unhappy with having <coughs> had to take over the commuter lines from the defunct freight railroads that it was put together to run. It felt that these things were a burden on it, they didn't want it, and so on. So Congress passed, and I'm losing the years now, I'd have to go back and refresh my memory, but Congress passed uh, essentially a law that said, as of a certain date, uh, Conrail was to divest itself of any passenger traffic whatsoever, that the various commuter lines that it had picked up along with the acquisition of the railroads, the freight railroads, were to be either offered back to the local municipal entities that they served, uh, or <clears throat> if the local municipal entities didn't pick them up, the act of Congress created a thing called the Amtrak Commuter Services Corporation, which had its headquarters in Philadelphia. And uh, the Amtrak Commuter Services Corporation was allocated uh, seven or eight or ten million dollars or so for organizational purposes and study purposes to prepare itself to take over any of the commuter railroads in the metropolitan areas around the country, anywhere in the country, uh, Chicago, New York, it doesn't matter, uh, Boston, if they weren't picked up by any local entity or authority. And uh, Dick Ravitch asked me to be on the board of the uh, Amtrak Commuter Services uh, 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 Corporation also. So I was down there, for, went down there a couple of times a month for three years. Uh, but as it turned out, uh, I was then chairing, chairing, the reason why he asked me to go on the Amtrak Commuter Services uh, Corporation Board, the federal corporation was, he had made me the chairman of the, uh, what was, when I came on the board, the uh, uh, Conrail, uh, uh, Conrail uh, Committee, mm -hmm. which oversaw our relations with Conrail on the Metropolitan Division of Conrail, which serviced New York. <clears throat> the, we converted that into the Metro North uh, Committee, and we took the metropolitan region of Conrail, which was a wreck, and uh, rebuilt it and created the Metro North Railroad, which services the Holland Division, Hudson Division, and the Haven Line, uh, all the way to New Haven, and uh, parts of it under contract with Connecticut, parts of it in, uh, on the west side of the Hudson. Also, we have a branch that goes out to Port Jervis, which is under contract with New Jersey Transit. But the rest of it is run directly by Metro North, which is one of the best commuter railroads in the country. We're proud of that too. 
Let me, we're getting down towards the end of the tape, so let me ask you a couple of questions. Um, you said you served in the reserves at Mitchell after the war? I took a five-year commission mm -hmm. when I was uh, 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 separated, and uh, I'd gotten a gang fine commotion with the captain, and I was given a captaincy in the reserves. It was a five-year commission, but uh, during the Korean War, uh, President Truman just extended them all. The, the commissions didn't expire because of the war, war uh, uh, exigencies, but uh, I let it lapse. I didn't renew. Uh, what did you fly when you were out at Mitchell? Were you with the... Uh yeah, I went out to Mitchell Field, and uh, AT-6 is really, that's about what they had. AT-6 is the advanced trainer. That oh, AT-6s? Yeah. I thought maybe you might have hooked up, there was a, a uh, all-weather fighter interceptor group there after the war. There might have been, but I was unassigned. I was not, uh, I was not in, in, an, in an organized outfit. I was simply uh, keeping my hand in. I was entitled to go fly, and uh, there was some hangar there where I just went and checked in and checked out an airplane and flew around and no responsibilities other than keeping some time in to keep my, keep my uh, skills up. The skies must have started to get crowded about that time over uh, Mitchell and Long Island. A little bit, yeah. Uh, but it was not what it is today. <laughs> and we didn't have all the air traffic control and we didn't have to check, I didn't have to check in with any center or anything like that. We, I mostly flew out to the other end of the island. I didn't stay away from it from the city. When you look back at it all, what stands out the most in your mind about your World War II experiences? Uh, there's, there's nothing in the world like being in and surviving the combat experience. Uh, and I don't know, I, I, I guess uh, if you want a good synopsis of what I think is probably an accurate summation of the whole thing, uh, Ambrose's book, Citizen Soldier, gives it. I mean, we just were a bunch of guys who, the country was in trouble and we went. Are you proud of what you did? Oh yes, absolutely. I have no criticism of Truman for dropping the atom bomb either. <laughs> I, Any last final thoughts you'd like to put on the tape? No, I just, uh, I don't know if you want this on the tape, you can clear it out if you want. I'm, I'm distressed today. I wrote a piece, or an op-ed piece for the Times, and I've been in the Times before. It wasn't taken. It was a dissenting opinion. I'm so outraged by this business of this alleged, uh, I mean, this spy plane, alleged landing, and having the land on Hainan Island in China. That son of a bitch should have been court-martialed when he came back, not given a medal. He didn't complete his mission. In fact, he destroyed his mission and he created an international incident. If that plane, when he got it under control, good airmanship, he got the plane under control. After he got the plane under control, he was at 8,000 feet, he didn't need oxygen for his crew. The plane was flying. If it could fly west, it could fly east. And if he had turned east, he could have made it maybe to the Philippines or Taiwan, or not to, to Formosa, uh, wherever. And at least he would have been multiples of 80 miles away from China. Suppose he did have to ditch it in the ocean. In the meantime, if you radio to the Navy to find some friendly ships in the area, rendezvous, get picked up, no international incident, the Chinese may never even have acknowledged that they lost a fighter if he didn't push it in their face. Hmm. Outrageous. And I said at the time when he came back, SLP should have been court-martialed, I bet she gets a medal. He got mm -hmm. a medal. Yeah. I, I, there's no responsibility anymore. And coincidentally, um, Senator Warner, chairman of the Armed Services Committee, was having uh, hearings just a, a couple of days, about the day I sent this thing into the op-ed uh, <coughs> time, my dissenting opinion, he was, he was giving the ch Joint Chiefs of Staff what for, because they weren't holding people responsible for failing their duties. In that case, he was criticizing the, the slap on the wrist that the, that the, the captain of the coal got for the bombing. But it's the same principle. I'm outraged that, 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 you know, everybody wants to paper over failures these days. I mean, I saw those bombers with people with one-tenth or, or, or less of the flying experience that this chap had, this Osborne had, bringing home bombers with half their tails gone, with wings off, with two engines out. You just flew them back, that's all. If they stayed in the air, you kept them in the air. What's the panic to get down? 
I'm not convinced he couldn't have gone all the way back to, to the Philippines or wherever the nearest island would, would be. And if he didn't get back there, they were prepared to ditch. He wouldn't have lost anybody and he wouldn't have had to... I, I, that, that's my final word. That's an interesting point. I, I'm outraged. I mean, I wrote, a, I wrote a, another thing that was just too much of a screed called the wimp factor in the military today. We, we, don't, we don't hold people to responsibility. We don't expect them to do anything. A, a, a case in point, I was outraged by this alleged success of this air war in, in, uh, in the Balkans. Outrageous. Shooting from 15,000 feet, you can't tell a convoy from a, from a refugee column. They were shooting up easy to hit uh, uh, infrastructure targets to punish the Serbs when what they should have been done is had the, the, the uh, warthogs and, and, the, and the gunships and things down at, at ground level where they're effective to wipe out every piece of Serbian armor and rolling stock that went into Kosovo. Those guys should have had to walk home, not ride home with their tanks. That would have been effective and we wouldn't have to have the taxpayers rebuild the infrastructure that we destroyed. Interesting point. Too, too afraid of losing somebody. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah.